This hearing's called to order. Good afternoon. Welcome, Administrator Bridenstine. Next week, on October 1st, NASA will reach a new milestone. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration will turn 60. And I have to say, Mr. Administrator, you don't look a day over 55. <laughs> The 60th anniversary of NASA's founding by Congress in 1958 provides an opportunity to not just look back at the past accomplishments, but to examine how we can build upon past glory to push NASA and our national space program forward to meet new challenges facing our nation in the 21st century. Our country should be proud of our history in space and recognize everyone who has stepped forward to serve our nation. The United States won the space race and planted an American flag on the surface of the moon that remains standing today. Many of the names that have made NASA a success, like Armstrong and Aldrin and Glenn, have become household names that are recognizable throughout the world. Others, like Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, and all the women who served as human computers have been hidden figures in our history and are just now getting the recognition that they deserve for their legacy of brilliance and strength. Looking forward, we have an opportunity to define a new generation, a generation that could witness American boots stepping foot on the surface of Mars and once again planting an American flag. However, in order to achieve this goal, there are a lot of key decisions that both Congress and the administration will have to make. I believe that, th that this begins with extending the oper operation and utilization of the International Space Station beyond 2024 to 2030. American taxpayers have invested over $100 billion in the ISS, and it is important that we maximize the return on taxpayer investment. China is expected to have an operational space station in low Earth orbit by 2022. We cannot cede low Earth orbit to China or to any other nation. The United States government must consider having a permanent human presence in low Earth orbit, which may require a government station after the ISS reaches the end of its useful operation. This can be accomplished without directly competing with the private sector and private space stations. We must also look to extend the presence of American astronauts beyond low Earth orbit into cislunar and deep space. The Trump administration is establishing a plan to return astronauts to the lunar surface by 2029. I share the administration's goal of returning the United States to the moon to establish a human presence and to begin commerce. However, it is imperative that our national space program doesn't get bogged down on the moon at the expense of reaching Mars. As I have previously noted, Mars is and I believe should be the focal point of our national space program. Sending Americans to the surface of Mars and beyond will define this next generation. I would like to thank Administrator Bridenstine for being here today. We live in interesting times. And we have the opportunity to ensure together that as the next space race begins, the United States will once again remain the leader in space. Now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Senator Nelson, to give his opening statement. And naturally, I would defer to the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, but he's kind enough, as I've explained to the administrator, uh, another committee uh, commitment, uh, the chairman is asking for me to be there, so I will slip on out after I've made a couple of comments. Uh, thank you for your continuing commitment to keep NASA apolitical. And thank you for listening to the very smart and dedicated professionals. Uh, this agency is just an amazing agency, and in, in many ways it thinks of itself as a family. 
as uh, you are uh, now finding out just how great a family that is. Uh, and there's so much happening, as we just discussed. In 2017, just last year, the U.S. now has led the world in the number of commercial space launches. Uh, it's in stark contrast to just six years ago when the U.S. had no U.S. commercial launch. And what a difference it has made at the Cape, which hosts two-thirds of the nearly 30 U.S. launches last year. And the jobs are soaring as a result of the fact that the rockets are soaring. Now we need to make sure we have the workforce and the infrastructure to keep up that growth. I've heard from the space employees and their employers, and they tell me our education system isn't keeping up with the demand. This is specifically in Florida for the highly skilled technicians. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you to find ways to help prepare workers for the good, high-tech paying jobs of the 21st century. Uh, as we just discussed in private, thanks for your attention to the Indian River Bridge. This is a bridge that goes from the mainland over to Merritt Island. Uh, it is a single point failure. If you don't have a bridge, you can't get some of the payloads over uh, to NASA and to the Air Force, for that matter. Uh, it, the deterioration of a bridge jeopardizes our access to space. And so we put in the Defense Authorization Act to get defense with skin in the game, uh, and NASA owns the bridge. So NASA is going to need to continue to lead the way as the Kennedy Space Director, Bob Cabana, has done so ably. And uh, we have talked with our colleagues on appropriations to understand the issue, so they'll be looking for your plan NASA's plan to replace the bridge. And uh, the 2017 authorization bill for NASA to define and deliver to Congress a step-by-step -step plan for reaching Mars. NASA delivered to us last week what was supposed to be delivered in 2017. Uh, the roadmap builds up to a human landing on the moon not later than the end of the decade. I'm interpreting that to be 2029. Then references a human mission to orbit or to fly by Mars sometime in the 2030s. You heard what the chairman said, and the chairman and I are of one accord because where we are going is we should be going. What is it going to take us to get to Mars on the surface of Mars in the decade of the 2030s? Flat budgets certainly aren't going to cut it. And we can't afford to sacrifice NASA's other critical priorities in so many other areas, including science and technology and aeronautics. And we certainly, this also, the chairman, the ranking member, I are all accord. Uh, we can't afford to walk away from the International Space Station in 2024 when NASA has made it very clear that we're going to have enduring needs for low Earth orbit. And so all of us are looking forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this um, very important hearing. Uh, when President uh, Kennedy addressed Rice University in 1962, he said, the growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation. This was true then, and it is even truer now. The discoveries from NASA's Science and Technology Directorate not only inform our understanding of space, but also often improve our lives here on Earth, as we learned during the recent hearing on the journey to Mars. That's why I am strongly concerned by some of the proposals contained in the President's budget request for 2019, which prioritize lunar exploration at the expense of other critical programs, such as Earth science and astrophysics. The President's request aimed to eliminate the Office of Education, which develops the next generation of NASA scientists. Uh, that, to me, is a mistake. It would merge the Science Technology Directorate into exploration research, further putting necessary technology development below exploration. And within our exploration missions, the administration is focusing on going back to the moon rather than achieving the ambitious goal of going to Mars and beyond. I believe that only a balanced portfolio of exploration, research, and technology will actually guide us boldly into a promising future, not just keep our eyes in the past. Mr. Uh, Bridenstein, you uh, were asked by me at your last visit here um, about the rampant fear amongst government scientists that they could be punished for speaking publicly about their work on climate science, with so many people working within the administration who deny basic climate facts. We are relying on NASA to recruit the brightest of all scientists to produce the best possible science, including research that looks into our effect on the globally changing climate. I look forward to hearing what steps you have taken to protect scientists and continue to promote climate science uh, at your um, testimony before the Appropriations Committee. I heard very positive comments uh, that you made uh, on this subject, and I'm looking forward to further exploring it here today. Uh, I hope to continue to see NASA prioritize the Earth science and technology development that could help us all better understand the threats posed by climate change, a mission it is particularly well suited to carry out with its understanding of climates on other planets and its unique view of our own. We'll need all the brilliant minds at NASA to continue studying climate change, researching other worlds, and developing new technologies that will continue to bring us into the future and humans to other planets. So I thank you for testifying today, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this very, very timely hearing. Yeah, Mr. Chairman? Just one uh, quick comment. First of all, I'm not on the subcommittee, but I wanted to be here because I'm so proud of what uh, Administrator Bridenstine's doing, and uh, it, it, I know you're going to keep focused on our mission as, as uh, opposed to some of the other agendas that are floating around here. But uh, I'm chairing another hearing. I want to hear your opening statement. I'm proud of you and looking forward to great things. We welcome Senator Inhoff to the subcommittee. And, and I would note of our ranking member, I'm grateful for his quoting JFK at Rice. I just wish he would fulfill his potential to this committee and do the full Boston accent when you're quoting JFK. <laughs> uh, and, and if I could be so presumptuous as to speak on behalf of your, co your constituents as well in encouraging. Uh, I, uh, I try uh, when I'm speaking about the uh, future uh, to ensure that the past is uh, properly uh, represented in this hearing and in all other places uh, that I go to. My, my mother wanted me uh, to sound like this. Uh, 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 unfortunately, down the park, um, I had to drop this accent uh, and sound more like the other boys down at Dever Park in Malden, but uh, I appreciate it. Uh, we all grew up bilingual in Boston in the 60s, and, we, and I still have both accents. I, I can speak it as though, because of the impact he had on us, especially the speech at Rice University. 
it was something that we almost all memorized and were challenged by him to be here. And that's why Houston and Boston are linked historically in this mission uh, that uh, we're trying to advance here today. So thank you. Indeed, although I still haven't forgiven the Celtics for beating the Rockets in 86. <laughs> And in 81. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah uh, 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 I, I knew that was coming. You know, uh, the past uh, in Boston is, uh, is never in the past. The past <laughs> is always today as well. And so that's, <clears throat> so you have the space program and we have two NBA titles. So that's, <laughs> which I'm not sure is a good division. <laughs> well. I now have the opportunity to introduce our witness, Mr. Jim Bridenstine, as the current administrator of NASA. In his role at NASA, Administrator Bridenstine provides clarity to the agency's goals and aligns the strategic and policy direction of NASA with the interests and requirements of the agency's stakeholders and constituent groups. Prior to joining NASA, he was elected and represented Oklahoma's first congressional district in the United States House of Representatives. Senator Inhofe's old seat. Uh, where he served on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Before joining Congress, Administrator Bridenstine served as the Executive Director of the Tulsa Air and Space Museum and Planetarium. Administrator Bridenstine also served honorably in the United States Navy as a Navy f naval fighter pilot, where he flew combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Administrator Bridenstine completed a triple major in Texas, at Rice University and earned his MBA at Cornell University. The administrator is a dear friend of mine, and I will say, since he's been confirmed, every time I have the chance to interact with, with employees at NASA, with, with scientists, with engineers, just my flight from Houston to DC, on Monday I sat next to two NASA engineers and I asked everyone the same question, which is, how's Jim doing? What kind of job he's doing? And without exception, every person I've asked has given glowing reports, he's terrific, he's passionate, he cares about the agency, and, and, and we're moving in the right direction. So with that, Administrator Bridenstine, uh, you may give your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of risk here, but since uh, my alma mater has been mentioned a number of times, uh, I'd like to bring up a, another critical point that um, our President John F. Kennedy asked in that very important address at Rice University. And it's a question all of us should be asking uh, when we think about NASA. It's a question that is very profound, and the question was this. He asked, why does Rice play Texas? And the, the answer was, of course, uh, this speech was in 1962, one of the greatest orations in the history of the United States of America. The answer, of course, was because in 1965, Rice was going to beat Texas. Uh, and of course, again in 1994 when I was a sophomore, actually 95 when I was a sophomore, we beat Texas again. So the answer for the president is we play Texas because we're racking up wins. That's why we play Texas. Um, well, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee, I am very pleased to be, for you, uh, to be before you here today. NASA is proud to be at the forefront of a global effort to advance humanity's future in space and scientific discovery leading the world while capitalizing on our nation's great capacity for exploration and innovation. Pursuant to the National Space Policy Directive 1 and consistent with the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017, NASA is pursuing, quote, an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners to enable human expansion across the solar system and to bring back to Earth new knowledge and opportunities, unquote. We will transition the ISS, returning humans to the surface of the moon and lunar orbit, where we will build the systems, deep space infrastructure, and operational capabilities to expand human presence beyond the Earth-Moon system. The National Space Exploration Campaign builds on 18 years of Americans and our international partners living and working continuously on the International Space Station. It leverages the advances made in commercial launch vehicle capabilities, robotics, and other technologies, and accelerates in the next few years with the launch of Orion, the Orion crew capsule and the space launch system, uh, which will expand human exploration to cislunar space and to the surface of the moon. A key component of establishing the first sustainable American presence and infrastructure on and around the moon 
is the Gateway, a spacecraft assembled in cislunar space that will be used as a staging point for missions to the lunar surface and to deep space destinations. A strong focus on robotic activities and infrastructure will enable ongoing investigations and autonomous operations between crew visits to the Gateway. NASA will develop an open architecture that meets national objectives. We will draw upon a variety of innovative partnerships with U.S. commercial industry, other government agencies, academia, and international partners. So when I say open architecture, I'm talking about the idea that commercial companies could build landers or they could build tugs that would actually integrate with the gateway in orbit around the moon. So the way we do docking, the way we share power is all, is all gonna be part of the open architecture that the United States of America will lead. The exploration campaign is designed to enable early successes, relying on seamless collaboration across the agency, including deep space exploration systems, exploration technology, low earth orbit and space flight operations, and elements of science and the rapidly advancing capabilities of our commercial partners. NASA will expand public-private partnerships to develop and demonstrate technologies and capabilities to enable new commercial space products and services. NASA's planetary, astrophysics, earth science, and heliophysics missions will continue to advance our understanding and take and make exciting new discoveries to preserve American leadership in science, making civilization changing discoveries and improving our understanding of critical issues such as space weather to preserve American assets in space and improve our lives here on earth. NASA will continue to, to sustain and develop new partnerships to explore transformative technologies and approaches. Upcoming early stage innovation activities will investigate areas such as breakthrough propulsion, challenges in deep space human habitation, space optimized energy systems, radiation protection, and materials. These areas are part of a comprehensive approach to efficiently support innovative discovery, progress towards important goals, and development of exciting new capabilities. NASA is leading an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners to enable human expansion across the solar system and bring back to Earth new knowledge and new opportunities. The agency will return astronauts to the moon and encourage the creation of a thriving commercial space economy in LEO and beyond. We will monitor the Earth and the sun, explore the planets of our solar system, observe the universe beyond, and make aviation safer, more efficient, and more environmentally friendly. We appreciate this subcommittee's continued support, and I would be pleased to respond to any questions. Thank you, Administrator, and thank you for your good work. Um, in your opinion, what are the top priorities for NASA that Congress should look to address uh, in a new NASA reauthorization? That's a, a wonderful question, Senator, and um, the, I think the biggest the biggest thing on my plate as the NASA administrator as we go forward is leading a sustainable return to the moon. And I don't even like to use the word return to go forward to the moon sustainably. So we have seen what happens with reusable rockets. The cost goes down and the access to space goes up. We want the entire architecture between the Earth and the moon to be reusable. We want tugs that go from Earth orbit to lunar orbit to be reusable. We want that gateway in orbit around the moon to be there for a very long period of time. Think of a, a reusable command module. So it will be there um, reducing cost because it is, in essence, not permanent, but it will be there for 15 years. And we want reusable landers that can go back and forth from the gateway to the surface of the moon. The more the architecture is reusable, the longer we're going to be able to take advantage of the resources of the moon and explore more parts of the moon than ever before. The other thing, and this is, this is Space Policy Directive 1, commercial partners, international partners, sustainable architecture to the moon, take all of those capabilities, and this is a key part, and I heard this, um, of course, from Senator Nelson, take all of those capabilities and replicate them at Mars. The moon is our proving ground for the ultimate goal, which, sir, you have identified as well, which is we're going to Mars. The moon is our path, the best way to get there, to retire risk so we can have mission assurance getting to Mars. So, so focusing on those areas, 
The integration of international partners and commercial partners into a sustainable architecture I think is important. We also, and, and I know uh, Senator Cruz, you've been very laser focused on the regulatory environment surrounding space. That's going to be tremendously helpful because this architecture is going to take advantage of all of our commercial partners. NASA will be able to buy services because there's a robust commercial marketplace where we are one customer of many customers rather than the purchaser, owner, and operator of certain systems. That drives down costs, increases access. So um, reforming those, those, the regulatory regime, I think, is, is important as well. Um, and of course, another area that this committee I know has been focused on is the space situational awareness and space traffic management challenges that our country has. Uh, certainly, we have astronauts. We're the only agency in the federal government that has humans in space threatened by the orbital debris that exists. So I, I think it's critical that, that we focus on that as well. The closest alligator to the canoe right now, sir, is launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle. That's the one thing I'm focused on more than anything else, because we need to make that happen by the middle of next year. We're on track to do that, and we're focused on it. So those would be my biggest takeaways. Well, and I had the opportunity to join you at Johnson Space Center for the announcement of the first commercial crew of astronauts that will be launched on a U.S. rocket from U.S. soil, and that, that, that is a major milestone to return to for NASA. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about, with respect to the moon, sustainability. Uh, is it NASA's intention to, to construct a habitat that would be sustainable on an ongoing basis on the lunar surface? Is that, is that part of the plan? The, the answer is yes. Um, immediately, no. The first thing is we have to put what we call the gateway into what we call a near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon. So that's an orbit where it's balanced between the gravity well of Earth and the gravity well of the moon. And because it's balanced, it can stay there for a long period of time. But interestingly, it's also going to have propulsion, solar electric propulsion, which means it can not only stay in that halo orbit that's going to be equatorial in nature, but it can also go to the L1 point and the L2 point, giving landers more access to more parts of the moon than we've ever seen before. For, this is an important point. 1969, we landed on the surface of the moon. Up until 2008, we didn't know if there was water on the surface of the moon or not. People argued that maybe there was, but we had no definitive proof. In 2008, we learned that there was. 2009, we now know that there's hundreds of billions of tons of water ice on the surface of the moon. So this architecture, in my, in my opinion, sir, the best place to start is getting more landers and more rovers and more prospectors to more parts of the moon than ever before so that we can discover and learn things that we, we didn't learn from 1969 to 1972 when we were landing in the equatorial regions. If, if we go direct to the habitat on the surface of the moon, we run the risk of learning a whole lot about one spot on the moon. Um, and given the constraint of the budget, it's my assessment that we need to have more access to more parts of the moon. And humans would certainly be part of that, but not necessarily a permanent human presence of course, in the long term, yes, and the architecture is open, which means commercial partners, they can build their own habitats, and in fact, a lot of them right now are raising private capital to do just that, which we, we love, because then we could, in essence, be a customer of that habitat for NASA's exploration and research as well. And, and describe to this committee and the American people uh, the importance of water on the moon for sustainability and human habitation. Yes, sir, wonderful question. Um, so water represents, of course, drink. You know, we get to drink this. It keeps us alive. Um, but it's also hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is air to breathe. And if you think about what powered the space shuttles, for example, rocket engines. It was liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that powered the space shuttle. In fact, you know, our vehicles today uh, that we're building, the, the space launch system, is powered with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. So water is life support, but it's also rocket fuel. And if we, can, if we can figure out a way, even commercially, where NASA would be a customer, we'd have, you know, commercially, people could harness the water ice of the surface of the moon, put it into orbit in cryogenic form, in, in you know, highly pressurized, frozen form, solid form, that, or I should say liquid form. Um, that liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen could be, in essence, a fueling depot in orbit around the moon. The glory of the moon, unlike the Earth, 
the moon has no atmosphere. So if you look at the things that we launched off the moon back in the 1960s, 1970s, those items, you, you would never see anything like that launch off the surface of the Earth. Why? Because there's no atmosphere on the moon. And the gravity well is one-sixth that of the Earth. It's easy to get things off the surface of the moon. It's very difficult to get things off the surface of the Earth. So when there is an asset, a natural resource, like water, that is on the surface of the moon, and we know it's there in hundreds of billions of tons, in my estimation, we should, we should utilize it. Now, again, I'm not saying that, you know, this is kind of science fiction in the future, kind of thinking about the future. But if we could, then we could, in essence, reposition satellites in geostationary orbit around the Earth using fuel from the moon, which would be potentially in the future less expensive than using fuel from the Earth. And I'm not saying that it is. This is something to think about in the future. But there are natural resources on the surface of the moon. The other thing that's important to note, Space Policy Directive 1 says, for the first time in American history, we're going to utilize the resources of the moon. We're going to utilize that water ice. We now know because of the research NASA does that there's, ice on, there's water ice on the moon. And in fact, there's new water being created every day from charged particles coming from the sun impacting the, the regolith on the moon. Now, it's not, we're not creating tons of, of ice or water on the moon. That's not happening. But there is a hydrocycle. There's a water cycle uh, on, on the moon that um, a, a number of years ago we didn't even know existed. What else do we not know about the moon? And that's why I think it's so important to go to more parts of the moon than ever before. We, we know there are rare earth metals on earth. Those rare earth metals are not earth metals at all. They're asteroid impacts from a very long time ago. And we know that the moon probably went through the same debris fields that the Earth went through back in those days, which means could there be those kind of metals on the moon where there isn't an active geology, where there isn't an active hydrosphere? Could, could those rare Earth metals be there? I don't know. NASA doesn't know. In fact, nobody knows. But if there's potentially trillions of dollars of that activity there, uh, it, it, it would make sense. That could change the balance of power on Earth. And, and of course, that's that's why a lot of private companies are raising money to go to the moon, and it's why other countries around the world are focused on the moon. So I think it's important for us to, to, to know and, and be the first. Uh, one final question. So the report that NASA submitted to Congress outlines a plan to return to the lunar surface no later than 2029. Now, I would note um, President Kennedy's speech at Rice was, that, that has been referenced multiple times today was given on September 12, 1962, calling for our country to go to the moon within a decade. And seven years later, Neil Armstrong would step foot on the lunar surface on July 20, 1969. So help this committee understand why it took seven years in the 1960s to get to the moon, and yet today uh, it's, it's going to take till the end of the 2020s. W wonderful question. And Senator, just so you know, that's the first question I asked when I showed up as the, as the NASA. Why is it taking so long? There's a couple of things that are colluding here. Number one, um, you know, back then, if you look at real dollars, the budget of NASA was about $50 billion annually. You know, right now we're talking about a, a $21 billion annual budget. So it's, it's a lot less of a budget. The other thing that's important to note is what we're doing now is entirely different than what we did back then. Back then, it was, it was a space race. We were trying to defeat the Soviet Union by getting there first, proving our technological superiority, proving our economic and political superiority um, in conjunction with that, in essence, space race victory. What we're doing today is entirely different, and we're the only country on the face of the planet that can lead this effort, and that is this. 1969 to 1972, we had six missions land on the surface of the moon with 12 people. And then we came home, and we haven't been back since. What Space Policy Directive 1 says is we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to go sustainably. In other words, we're going to build an architecture where we can go back and forth. And we're going to have landers and rovers and robots and humans with access to the moon, more access to more parts of the moon than ever before, utilizing because of the budget constraints, utilizing international partners and utilizing commercial partners with an open architecture where the United States of America is in the lead. And then others can build parts or pieces and ultimately advance our agenda, which is to lead in space. 
Um, so, so what we're doing is different, a sustainable architecture where we can get to more parts of the moon, going to the poles, uh, and learning more than we've ever been able to learn before, uh, and at the same time doing it at a budget that's much less. So when you do the analysis, and I've, we, we've just went through a process at NASA where we did the analysis, the question is, how is it that given the advances in technology, the miniaturization of electronics, how is it that we're not able to do more than we did in the 1960s? The answer is, we're doing a lot more than we ever did in the 1960s, and we're doing it with a budget that's uh, just a lot smaller. Thank you. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, by the way, that was a very interesting discussion. I think that everyone who heard it was uh, <clears throat> given a lot of information that uh, helps them understand the perspective of where we are today. Um, and, but as we strive to reach faraway planets and see beyond the stars, we cannot neglect our understanding of our own tiny little blue dot that we live on. The President's fiscal year 19 budget request attacked several decadal recommended Earth science missions, cutting funding entirely for some key climate science projects. Mr. Bridenstine, do you agree with the recommended cuts to climate science in the fiscal year 19 budget request? So um, a, a couple of things to note. Um, NASA, the, 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 the Earth science budget of NASA in the President's budget request for FY 2019 was higher than three years of President Obama's budget request. So I, I, I want to be clear that we're, we are committed to studying planet Earth um, at NASA as we always have been. It goes back to 1958. NASA has been involved in studying the Earth as required by law since 1958. Some of those programs that you mentioned, Senator, um, Clario, Pathfinder, or, uh, it was Clario, um, I think uh, Pace was one of them, uh, OCO3. OCO3 um, is being launched in January. Uh, it's, it's funded, it's done. Uh, Clario and Pace are, because of the laws passed by this, by this body, they're being built um, as we speak. Um, it, it is my goal as the administrator of NASA to follow the decadal surveys that we get from the National Academy of Sciences, um, and, uh, and, and that's my objective, to make sure that what we're doing is apolitical and, and nonpartisan. So, so you're not going to reject the decadal recommendations? No, sir. But the administration's budget, in essence, does. So how do you square that? So uh, I don't think that it, it does reject the decadal survey. Uh, what we're trying to do is follow the guidance of the decadal survey that says what earth science information we need to collect. Um, and, and that's ultimately what we're doing. So the second ever decadal survey for Earth Science Directorate was released in January of 2018. As it notes, Earth Science provides a essential information infrastructure element for society. Uh, this work is used in everything from land use planning to the data in your weather app. Mr. Bridenstine, how are you working to implement the recommendations of the Earth Science decadal survey, including innovative new missions to study how our planet is changing from the vantage point of space? It's a wonderful question, and the, the, the only way we can understand our changing planet, and our planet is changing, um, is, to, is to study it from space. So we, we have satellites that can look at the hydrosphere and the atmosphere, the, even the ionosphere, um, the, the lithosphere, um, the... Uh, all the different spheres within the Earth system are being um, evaluated by satellites built by NASA. And because we have made these investments and we continue to make these investments, we're, we're getting a better understanding of planet Earth than ever before. Um, and that's, I think, there's broad bipartisan agreement that we need to understand what is happening to our planet. And it's my objective as the NASA administrator not to delve into how to deal with what we find, but to deliver dispassionate science so that policymakers can make decisions on it. So, Mr. Bridenstine, do you support the recommendation that NASA create new competitive mission categories that would fly lower-cost Earth science missions and help scientists continue critical Earth science observations over a longer period of time? 
Yes, I do. I, I think we need a balanced portfolio, Senator. So a balanced portfolio. So we need, we need flagship missions, big missions that are capable of doing very exquisite, exquisite science. We need medium class missions and smaller missions. There is risk in big missions, a lot of dollars involved, and if they're not successful, then it's a failure and it costs a lot. So we need a balanced portfolio, but the answer is yes, sir, I do. I do appreciate the question, and, and we, we, will in, we will continue to invest in those smaller missions. Yeah, so with Earth Sciences, NASA doesn't have to choose between the inspirational and the practical. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a twist on the old saying, we can keep our eyes on the ground while our feet are in the stars. And that's something that it's good to hear you uh, comment on. Uh, in my opening statement, I talked a, a little bit about your views on climate uh, science. I'd like for this committee hearing, if you could, to talk about that subject as you did before the Appropriations Committee so that uh, we can have that on record here as well. You, you bet. So carbon dioxide um, is a greenhouse gas. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know anybody, and, and no scientist for sure, that would reject the notion that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Um, it is pre prevalent in our atmosphere, and now uh, it's more prevalent than ever before because of human activities. And so it is without question that human activities are contributing to the global warming that we're seeing. Um, now, what, Na NASA scientists have concluded that it's the dominant cause of the warming. Uh, do you agree with that, though, that finding? I, I have no reason to reject that analysis. Okay, well, that's important to hear. Um, and you, you committed to protecting scientific integrity at yes, NASA. Sir. Can you give us some examples of how you've worked at NASA to counteract the reported fear that scientists feel across our federal agencies at this time when it comes to the subject of climate science? So NASA scientists um, have permission for me, and of course they did before and they still do, and I have, I have not done anything to change that. They have permission to um, speak at uh, symposia. They have permission to write op-eds. They have permission to put what they learn, um, you know, make it public, and we support that. Um, if there are other scientists within NASA that want to disagree with the assessment, they have the freedom to disagree with whatever that assessment is. I believe in transparency and, and, and openness, so I, I'm 100 percent in support okay. of, uh, of giving people the ability to speak their, their mind in, as it relates to, to science. Yeah, and they're super, super talented uh, people. Just to go to the chairman's comment, um, my grandmother died uh, when my mother was a junior in high school, and she, um, as a result, although she was going to be, you know, class president and uh, top girl in her class, she had to stay home to be the mother to the three younger girls, and then the one older sister went off to work. So, um, so when I was growing up, the younger sisters all had children before my mother because she's still at home. And one of the sisters had a son, seven years older than me, who was so such a brilliant student in physics that when President Kennedy gave that speech at Rice University, uh, he went off to NASA. Mm -hmm. And the oldest child of one of the other sisters, she was a brilliant math student. And in this movie, Hidden Figures, um, they talk about the Fortran program at IBM. And so she was one of the first five women in the Fortran program at IBM that was documented in this uh, movie hidden figures. Um, so um, then I come along with no scientific ability at all, so, which is a disappointment to my mother. However, I hear President Kennedy's statement, and, uh, and so my goal was to ensure that we fund the scientists, the, mathemat the mathematicians, the computer geniuses who can accomplish these goals, which is what this committee is all about. It's to evaluate the uh, programs uh, to ensure that the money that the federal government is appropriating is being used uh, in a way that um, helps to advance our goals as a nation and as a planet. Um, and so I'm, 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 uh, I'm very interested, um, Mr. Administrator, just in ensuring mm -hmm. you know, that there's no discouragement to these brilliant people. I was related to them. 
I was told that I should be like one of them. I can't be. They have a gift, and they give that gift to the United States when they go to work at NASA. It's an incredible gift. Uh, and we don't want any of them to feel at any time that they are threatened because they have done work that just reached a correct scientific conclusion. I agree. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Markey. Um, Administrator Bradstein. China has announced their intention to have an operational space station in low Earth orbit by 2022. Uh, do you have concerns that if the administration were to deorbit the ISS in 2024, that China could have the only operational platform in low Earth orbit? It's a big concern, but the, to, to, to be perfectly clear, there is no plan to deorbit the International Space Station. <laughs> uh, so if that was the case, the answer would be very concerned. Um, what we want to do is, is transition to commercialization of low Earth orbit. Again, if, if NASA can be one customer of many customers, it drives down our costs. And if we have multiple providers that are competing on both cost and innovation, we see what happens when, when, when we had launch providers competing on cost and innovation. For the first time, we're seeing these rockets launch and then come back and land, and then we use them again. And because they're proven, insurance rates are actually lower than they would have been for a new rocket, which is uh, an amazing kind of, un, you know, I didn't predict, a lot of people didn't predict that we're building certainty and at the same time saving money. Imagine, imagine Senator, uh, when you flew to Washington, D.C. from Houston, Texas. When you got here, you had to throw the 737 in the trash. That would be a very expensive plane ticket. Uh, but because we can reuse airplanes over and over again, it drives down the cost, it increases access, now the whole world can fly. We're trying to do the same thing in space. And we're doing it right now with launch. And we're seeing a lot of success. But it's because, quite frankly, uh, we heard Senator Nelson talk about how uh, the United States of America is now the largest exporter of commercial launch. And in fact, we're not just the largest, um, we're larger than the rest of the world combined at 60, at 57 percent predicted this year it would be 65 percent. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing. The question is why did that happen? It's because NASA said we want to buy launch as a service and we want you providers to compete on how you're going to sell us your service. We're going to, instead of purchasing, owning and operating our rockets, we want you to, and ask, we're going to pay you for the service and we're going to be one customer of many and we want you guys to compete on price. All of a sudden we're seeing reusable rockets. And that's increase, that's now <laughs> launch as an export for the United States of America at a time when, when we have right now in this country uh, a massive trade deficit. So, so that's, that's a positive thing and NASA is a big piece of why that is. Question is, can we replicate that in low Earth orbit? And there are companies that are interested internationally uh, building consortia that could maybe operate the International Space Station, you know, commercially. Is that possible? I don't know, but, 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 but what we have done, and I think this is an important point, we have forced the conversation to take it very seriously. There was a time at the end of the Apollo program and before the space shuttle program where we had eight years where we weren't launching into space. And of course, now that the retirement of the shuttle is complete and we don't have commercial crew yet, yet we've got another eight-year gap. What we want to do is avoid any gap in low Earth orbit. We know that there's a definitive life for the International Space Station. We don't know specifically when that is, uh, but what we want to do is make sure that we are prepared to avoid any gap in low Earth orbit. So, sir, your, your, your point is very well made and we're thinking about it all of the time at NASA and within the administration. I want to clarify two points on your answer. Uh, number one, you agree that it would be completely unacceptable for the only operational platform in low Earth orbit to be China's? Yes, 100 percent. At, at any point in time, we cannot cede low Earth orbit to China? Yes. Um, we've also heard testimony from multiple witnesses before this subcommittee that as a matter of uh, the science, as a matter of the structural integrity, uh, that the ISS is usable at least until 2030. Uh, do you agree with that assessment from a scientific and technical perspective? There, um, it, it is probably possible, yes. The question is, um, how much risk are we assuming and what is the cost of, of making that happen? And, and so um, it is technically feasible to, to keep it alive 
to 2030, and maybe even beyond that. Technically, it can be done. Yes. We talked earlier about the impact, um, uh, about the objective is going to the moon and a lot of exciting things about there. But as I said in my opening statement, I want to make sure the moon does not distract from the ultimate objective of Mars. Can you describe how going to the moon is useful for the mission of going to Mars and, and how we will keep the focus on Mars and not get distracted by the intermediate step? Yes, sir. That's, that's a wonderful question. The, the intent is to get to, to Mars. And how do you get to Mars? Well, uh, we have this proving ground. And I think probably the best way to characterize it, we're all familiar with Apollo 13. Uh, it, was, it was a NASA failure, but also at the same time an amazing NASA success. Why was Apollo 13 a success, even though it was a failure? It was because it was, it, there, was, there was a technical problem uh, uh, that, that would have been catastrophic on the way to Mars, but because they were on their way to the moon, they were able to get home. The, the glory of the moon is that it's only a three-day journey home. So we can prove all of the technologies. We can reduce all of the risk. We can try all of the different maturations that are necessary to live and work on another world. And we can do it all at the moon where if there is a problem, if there is an emergency, we know that we can get people home. The challenge with Mars is that if we go there for the first time, and, and there's the other challenge, not just the technology and the retirement of risk technologically, the other challenge is human physiology. We know based on what we've learned on the International Space Station that our astronauts, um, they lose one to three percent of their bone mass every month on the International Space Station. Their, their cardiovascular system becomes deconditioned. Their neurovestibular system, of course, um, gets thrown out of whack to the point where sometimes it takes weeks, if not months, when they get back before they can even drive a car again in some cases. Not in all cases, in some cases. Um, we know that the immune system is very challenged and stressed in a microgravity environment to the point where it's very easy to get sick in a microgravity environment. And we know, of course, when you go beyond low Earth or orbit, there's this radiation environment that can have effects on the human body that we are still learning about. Of course, we don't want to use humans as the, the test case for that. Um, so all of these physiological changes and, and, and understandings we've learned from the International Space Station while, we've, while we have humans there for a period of six months, in, in many cases, in, in at least one case, you know, up to a year in, in low Earth orbit. Now imagine you know, a seven to nine month journey to Mars with all of those physiological challenges happening. And then when you get to Mars, you have to live and work. You have to be perfect. You cannot make a mistake because if you do, you will not live. And all of those physiological, physiological changes and challenges, and then when you get there, you can't come home for at least two and a half years because Mars has to be in line with the Earth before you can make that journey home. But, so it's, a, it's about a two-year, 26-month evolution before you can come home, and of course then you've got a six-month journey home. So this, this presents a challenge where do you really want to test all of this out for the first time at Mars? Or can we prove it and test it out on the moon? And that, in fact, would accelerate our path to get to, get to Mars. So it's technology, it's physiology. The moon is the proving ground, the Mars is the, and Mars is the goal. So I think that's the, that's the reason we go to the moon. So and my advice is, is please don't leave Matt, Matt Damon behind when, when you get <laughs> to Mars. Um, all right, three more questions. Uh, one, can you just confirm, as Senator Nelson made reference to in his opening, uh, opening remarks, that the objective is not simply to orbit Mars, but it is to land and have an American boot on Mars and plant an American flag on Mars and, and begin exploring Mars? Yes, sir. The, the, that's why we go to the surface of the moon. Uh, the, you know, the moon is very different than Mars in the sense that Mars has an atmosphere. So landing on Mars is far more difficult than, than on the moon. I know that sounds weird. They have an atmosphere. Why would that be harder? Well, when you have to re-enter into an atmosphere and, and, the, and the velocities at which you're traveling, it becomes a very complicated scenario. Now, here's the, the good thing. The United States of America is the only country that has successfully landed on Mars. We've done it seven times, and we're doing it again uh, April, uh, let's see, no, November 26th, the Monday after Thanksgiving at 11 a.m. So that's going to be a, you know, another big day for the United States of America. So all of that um, being said, um, th there are differences between the moon and Mars, but we do want to get to the surface of Mars, uh, and so we want to replicate as much as we can from the moon. We want to prove and, 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 and test as much as we can at the moon, 
And then where we need to make changes, while we're doing that at the moon, we're going to be developing the technologies and capabilities for Mars. You know, we talked about the gateway, which would be in orbit around the moon. Think of a, a reusable command module that our landers can go back and forth from uh, to the surface of the moon. We think about the tugs from Earth orbit to, to, uh, to, to, to lunar orbit. That gateway... You know, the first one is a technology demonstrator. It's about proven capability. It's about NASA learning how to do this again. The second one, and there's no decision that's been made on this. I'm just thinking visually, like, wh what is the second one? Well, the second one could very well be a deep space transport. That's our path to get to Mars. So what we do at the moon is critically important for going to Mars. And a lot of the experts that you'd talk to at NASA would say, we can't get to Mars without going to the moon. Okay. Um, last month, I was joined by Senator Cornyn and Representatives Babin, Culberson, and Smith in sending you a letter requesting that NASA's Johnson Space Center serve as the lead center for NASA's lunar, lunar Lander Program. In my opinion, JSC is a natural fit for the program given that JSC has historically served as the lead center for human space flight for more than half a century. Uh, has NASA made any decisions pertaining to how it intends to set up the, the Lunar Lander Program? You're really trying to make me make news, aren't you, Senator? Doing my best. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, Johnson Space Center, critical part of all of our lunar activities. It will be part of, you know, the gateway, part of landers as well. As far as um, what centers are going to have specific res what responsibilities, um, we're going through a process right now to evaluate all of that. Um, just know that Johnson Space Center is going to be, a, a, you know, a critical piece of that. Uh, but I'm not ready to, to, to announce, you know, you know, what their particular position will be. Okay. Final question. Uh, last month, uh, I introduced legislation, was joined by uh, Senator Markey, Senator Nelson, Senator Thune. Uh, legislation was called the Hidden, Hidden Figures Way Designation Act. And it was legislation to rename the street in front of NASA's headquarters here in Washington, Hidden Figures Way, after the incredible pioneers, the African-American mathematicians who blazed the way uh, for, for our going to the moon. Uh, the D.C. City Council Chairman Mendelssohn introduced a companion bill last week that was joined by all 12 other council members, so unanimous companion bill, uh, to rename the street uh, in a strong show of support for every woman who has worked for NASA as a, as a human computer. Uh, it's likely that the street in front of NASA headquarters will be designated as Hidden Figures Way before the end of the year. In your judgment, what will the new street name uh, mean for the culture uh, and, and for the employees at NASA? It's a wonderful question, and it's an important part of who we are as an agency. Uh, as you're aware, NASA is probably the single most inspirational federal agency that we have. And if you walk around the headquarters building and you ask people that are old enough, where were you when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, they'll tell you right where they were and they'll tell you how it changed their lives, the education that they got because of it, and ultimately how they ended up at NASA. It was transformative. Um, and yet, we, you know, we know the names Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Of course, um, you know, Katherine Johnson was responsible for calculating the orbital trajectory um, for John Glenn, uh, which, of course, another critically important mission. But there, there are so many, you know, I, I think when we landed on the moon, the, the, the number of people that were involved in that project at the time was around 400,000. I mean, that's a lot of people. Um, and they're all critically important to what NASA is and what NASA does and the accomplishments of our country. And as you have rightly said, so many of them were hidden. Um, and the more we can give them credit and show them um, how they contributed, show the next generation how they contributed, um, that's what it's all about. We want to inspire that next generation. We want, we want NASA, we want to attract the absolute best and the brightest that America has to offer. Um, and so many of those people that were at that time hidden are um, now going to be those, you know, those moments of inspiration for the next generation. I was, when, when I was the summer between my fifth grade and sixth grade year, for the first time, uh, my, my mom put me in a, a summer camp where we got to play with a wind tunnel. Um, and uh, I got to play with the camber of a wing. I, I learned about Bernoulli's theory, and it changed the direction of my life. I knew on that 
you know, from that week forward, I was going to be a pilot. Didn't matter what I did for the rest of my life. I knew I was going to be a pilot. Um, and so uh, th- that had a transformational kind of impact on me. And, and then, you know, as I, as I um, eventually ran a Tulsa Air and Space Museum, I saw children have their lives transformed because of experiences they had with the volunteers and others at the Tulsa Air and Space Museum. So those kind of um, in, impactful things, I think, are important for developing the next generation of STEM in this country. And the reason that's so important, the country that controls the technology controls the balance of power on Earth. And that's true going back to the you know, beginning of time. Whoever controls technology controls the balance of power. That means our people here in the United States, we have to be preeminent in technology. So the more we can inspire that next generation into STEM, we need to do so. I think it's a, I think it's a great, great idea. You, you sound like you were a precocious fifth grader. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you, you and that Bernoulli fellow. <laughs> uh, Senator Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm like the guy who shows up right when everybody wants to go to bed uh, and uh, wants to have a long conversation. So I'll keep this quick and short. I apologize for being uh, late. Um, it, it, we've talked about dates and where were you. And I remember where I was on, I think it was the 8th of July in 2011. Uh, and uh, I was in the House uh, caucus room uh, right off the, the Republican conference or a caucus uh, room off the floor of the House of Representatives. And there were probably 30 or so, 40 members of Congress, and we were watching TV, and we were watching the last launch of the space shuttle. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching that thinking, this is great. We're all watching. This is bringing America together to celebrate the last human space flight from this country. Mm-hmm. We didn't know when it was going to start again. Right. We didn't know what was going to happen. So uh, I appreciate the work that you have done on the Orion Project and others and Mars uh, to, to help us retain that vision uh, so that when I looked around that room in that uh, cloakroom, not caucus room, I'm sorry, cloakroom, and I, and I uh, wondered, well, isn't somebody going to do something about this? Thank you for doing something about this. Yeah. Uh, thank you for working with Congress to do something about this. And when you said that uh, your mom had taken you to a wind tunnel, uh, I didn't realize she was the one that forced you to run for Congress. Uh, so, but I, <laughs> that happened sorry, later. It was summer camp. I'm sorry. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Administrator Bridenstine, thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Markey. Uh, thank you. And uh, this is the third hearing that Senator Gardner and I have been at together and mostly asking questions at the end of those hearings. <laughs> That's been our day. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, I just have another couple of questions. Um, the President's uh, budget request proposed to merge the Space Technology Mission Directorate into the Human Exploration Directorate. Merging these functions could force us to abandon or choose between key functions that NASA currently performs. Uh, do you agree that the Technology Directorate does invaluable basic research and advancement uh, areas other than um, human space exploration? Absolutely, yes, sir. Uh, I've heard reports that there are other arrangements up for consideration that would keep the technology directorate largely intact. Mr. Bridenstine, are you considering any organizational options that would preserve the technology directorate? Uh, the, the, the answer is um, what we're doing right now is we're going through a process, and there's a lot of pieces to this process. Um, that would include, uh, we had direction from the administration to look at how uh, FFRDCs uh, play into NASA's mission, the you know, federally funded research and development centers. We have uh, direction um, to look at, at some other things to include independent assessments and those kind of things. So what I'm doing right now, we're going through a, pr- a process at NASA. Are you considering any options um, that would preserve the technology directorate? We're, we're looking at all options, okay, yes, sir. That's good. Um, in a hearing earlier this year, Dr. Uh, Dava Newman talked about the importance of promoting synergies between science, technology, and human exploration. Um, the need to promote these synergies uh, is obviously important so that they're not suppressed. Uh, so I would hope that you would you know, consider uh, preserving that te- technology directorate. And finally, um, we didn't understand how much James Webb's space telescope would cost until halfway through its mission development. And we were recently told it would be more expensive still. This uncertainty makes it hard for scientists to make informed decisions about how to prioritize different missions uh, in the decadal uh, surveys. How is NASA working to improve mission concept development to ensure that we have a better idea 
at the outset of what these projects are going to cost? It's a, it's a wonderful question, sir. And, you know, James Webb Space Telescope um, is, of course, a big challenge for us right now um, because we have had this cost overrun and this delay. Um, we're putting in, in place, we, we, we called for an independent review team, um, uh, I guess it was at this point probably about a year ago. Um, that independent review team has done its work. We're now implementing all of their recommendations. There were 32 recommendations. Um, uh, 30 of them we, we have already implemented. We're, we're working through a couple of more. Um, but the, the, the key thing to remember, I think, that's important is what NASA does is, is we, we do things that have never been done before that are technologically very difficult and really, in some cases, uh, very difficult to even define ahead of time. So with James Webb, we're looking back to the very beginning of time. We're looking back to the very beginning of the universe, the very first light that existed in the universe. So, and it's being done in infrared, which means it has to be an extremely, extremely, almost zero Kelvin kind of infrared telescope. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of technologies that had to be invented along the way, many of which we didn't know what the cost would be at the time. So, so we have had the, the, this overrun. Going forward to your question, sir, we have to look at the portfolio that we have and, and have a balanced portfolio. You mentioned smaller missions earlier. If we can, if we can look at a balanced portfolio where we, we want to have that flagship mission that's critically important technologically, um, you know, superior and puts the United States number one in the world in physics. Exactly, and, and that's kind of what the goal is here, right? Yes, sir. Small investments in a timely fashion. Yes, sir. We'd make it possible for NASA to work smarter, not harder. And when a budget doubles, it's coming out of something else. Yeah. And something else, in many instances, is the vision that we would have had to accomplish bigger things, yeah. you know, challenge our country to what is possible from NASA. So I would just recommend to you that you, as the administrator, just go back and just start examining more closely each of the premises that people have, because ultimately we are budget constrained. We can obviously afford uh, some increases in NASA's budget, but uh, we're largely willing to fund um, consistent with the vision. But when a previous vision just gets bigger and bigger in right. terms of its budget allocation, it just makes it harder here. So we want to be as helpful as we can, so I just make that recommendation to you. And again, thank you. Thank you. Administrator Bridestone, a couple of questions. Uh, we spent a lot of time in this hearing talking about the objectives for NASA and the need for expenditures. I want to talk a little bit about the revenue side and increasing the resources NASA has available to do this. Uh, the Washington Post has reported that requests from individuals and companies to use NASA's logo on T-shirts and other commercial items uh, is getting a lot of interest. For example, there is NASA-themed apparel made for Target, Old Navy, Land's Ends, Coach, and H&M. Uh, the designer, Heron Preston, even sells a NASA T-shirt for $270. Uh, despite this commercial interest, NASA right now doesn't make anything on the sales of products using its logo. Do you agree with this policy, and, and has NASA taken any steps to receive compensation off the sale of the agency's logo? Uh, that, that is a, an important question, uh, and so, so the, the answer is we have a logo. You know, we have a right to that logo, and because we have the rights to that logo and somebody else finds value in it, um, they, they should pay for the rights to use that logo. I get that. And, and I'll be honest, I don't know if anybody's bought the rights to use that logo or not. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked into this issue. I, I have noticed, as you have, I'm seeing a lot of NASA t-shirts on the streets. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you, I have found that personally as a source of pride that people are so interested in it. And I haven't, I haven't made any effort to try to quell it or squash it. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. And, and I'll be honest, I don't know what the right answer here is. Um, if, if you have any ideas, I'd be more than thrilled to listen to them. But it, this, this, in my view, I love the fact that I see so many NASA logos on the streets. Well, for, for what it's worth, I agree with you that it's a great thing that people are excited about NASA, that they're wanting to wear NASA clothing, but I, but I also think that, that NASA should be compensated for it. And, 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 and I'm a believer in commercializing 
and, and seeking revenue streams. And, and look, uh, I, I can tell you I've never owned any T-shirt that, that costs $270. And, and by the way, having seen your wardrobe, I'm pretty confident you haven't either. <laughs> um, but if somebody's paying $270 for a T-shirt, a chunk of that ought to go to NASA and actually help fund getting to the moon and getting to Mars. Um, a related point in terms of commercialization. Earlier this year, cases testified before our subcommittee that more than 55 percent of payloads to the national lab are private sector customers which includes projects from iconic Fortune 500 companies and innovation startups. Now, I want to be clear that I support having vast amounts of research conducted on ISS, but given that the American taxpayers are subsidizing the transportation costs to and from station, astronaut crew time to conduct the experiments, and the operational and maintenance cost of the National Lab, it is worth a close examination of how research is being conducted right now and if there's a need to alter current research agreements. A few specific examples. Goodyear is using microgravity to better understand silica morphology for manufacturing new tires with low rolling resistant, resistance that are more fuel efficient and safer. Cases material states that, quote, research could give Goodyear a competitive advantage in the tire industry by developing superior rubber, rubber materials. Another example, Merck is using microgravity to grow a crystalline suspension of millions of tiny uniform crystals to improve the formulation of the comp company's caster, uh, cancer immunotherapy drug, Keytruda. Keytruda is the drug that, that, that made former pr President Jimmy Carter's cancer go into remission, and Forbes has reported that some analysts predict that Keytruda may be Merck's next $10 billion drug. Administrator Breidestein, do you believe that NASA and Congress should re-examine these agreements to ensure that the American taxpayers are receiving fair compensation uh, for the research that is being conducted by iconic Fortune 500 companies that, and that may result in giving these companies a competitive advantage in their respective in industries? Yes, I, I do believe they, those, those kind of um, programs and, and, and opportunities on the International Space Station, we need to, we need to re-examine those. And, and I intend to do that as a new administrator. I, we, in fact, we are. <laughs> We're looking at it right now. It's also important to note, and I think this is an important point to make, we want those kind of activities happening inside the United States of America. And it's, it, th there is no shortage right now of enthusiasm on the part of our largest peer competitor, China, to have these activities going on on their space station uh, that they're building for the future. So we, the, the answer is yes, we need to examine it. What we don't want to do is we don't want to damage the commercialization of low Earth orbit um, because we are charging you know, for something that they can get for free in a different country. And so we, we have to be really careful about how we balance that. Um, but certainly it's something to take a look at. And, and I think that's a fair point and concern you raise and, and something that I look forward to continuing to work with you on. Uh, it seems to me we have many research universities uh, in the United States that have very successful commercialization programs where there's innovation and research being conducted in the universities, and the universities in turn uh, receive a portion of the profits, and that helps fund even more innovation, even more research, and, and that's a model it seems to me NASA should look at given the enormous potential, but you're right, we certainly need to look at it within a framework uh, of a competitive environment in China and other nations potentially as competitors. I would also add uh, both of these items that you've brought up, whether it's activities happening on the International Space Station um, that could potentially result in big profits for corporations, you know, terrestrially, I think that's an important thing for the United States to be leading in. Um, and e even something as simple as the NASA logo, um, the, these are ideas, I think, that we need to be considering. It's also important, and I'd love to work with you on this. As you're aware, um, appropriators guard very jealously um, appropriation dollars. And to the extent that we were to receive some kind of proceeds from those activities, and maybe there's an opportunity to do that and we should be doing it. Uh, my, my concern would be NASA would be doing all the work and then, and then those proceeds could end up going to the general treasury or they could end up, and, and look, I love the general, I want to retire the deficit as much as anybody else. Um, but what I don't want to, I would love to see us utilize those proceeds for the advancement of human spaceflight, for the advancement of, 
of our uh, you know, science, for the advancement of, of understanding our planet. These are the activities that I would love to see those proceeds going toward and not uh, necessarily just going into the general coffers. Well, unsurprisingly, you and I are on the same page on that. And, okay. and indeed, much of my interest here is, is to generate a revenue stream that can be dedicated directly to space exploration uh, to ensure that we have the resources to continue America's leadership going back to the moon and ultimately going back to Mars and ensuring that we have sufficient investment and that we're also in a position where we're leveraging billions more in private investment as well. And, yeah. and so I look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Yes. Administrator Bridenstine, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. I think this was a, a productive hearing. Uh, the hearing record will main, remain open for two weeks. During that time, senators are asked to submit any questions for the record. Uh, upon re re uh, receipt, the witness is requested to submit uh, your written answers to the committee as soon as possible. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Sir.